we'll get started. So first thing we'll do today is go through the uh, module two quiz. We'll go through those um, questions and solutions, and then we will jump into uh, the homework for module three, and then open it up for any questions related to the homework through the presentations, exercises, really anything associated with the course up to this point. Um, at any point, if you've got questions, feel free to either ask them over the phone or I'll be monitoring the chat so you can punch them in there. So let's get started. So module two quiz for question one. The first question was true or false. Extrapolation is typically used to calculate system response probabilities above the record stage. And that is going to be false. So we are doing everything that we can in our risk assessments not to extrapolate. Because as we showed during the uh, module presentation, when we extrapolate, things can be either higher or lower than what they really were. So we want to evaluate the full range for our stage frequency curve. So we will evaluate that up to at least top of dam and then beyond if, we, if there's a possibility for loading above. The answer is false. So question number two, when discretizing a stage frequency curve, which of the following is false? So the options are we've got loading intervals must be even. Um, they have to encompass the full range of loading. Uh, the last interval will be for all loads greater than the highest load in the relationship or none of the above. The correct answer is going to be, click there, that loading intervals must be even, that is false. So the default in a lot of our tools is for those intervals to be even. That's what's gonna happen initially in um, RMC QRA calcs. That's what happens by default in RMC total risk, um, but they don't have to be. So it's always a good idea to look for places where you have uh, inflection points in your system response and inflection points in your stage frequency curves and then your consequences and make sure that you have enough resolution around there. So depending on how many intervals you're using, you might want to type the intervals up around those particular points. Um, those other two, those next two options are both true. We want to make sure that our loading intervals go all the way up for the full range of loading and then in our last bin that's going to be for an exceedance probability. So that's going to be for all loads greater than the highest load in the relationship. Okay. So then question three here, we're given some data and we are asked to calculate the average annual life loss. So we have an APF of 2.7 times 10 to the nine minus four. We've got our day exposure and our night exposure. And then we've got some day life loss and night life loss. So to do this, we need to weight the life loss by their corresponding exposure. So that'll be our day exposure times our day life loss. And then we're gonna add to that our night exposure times our night life loss. And then take that product and multiply that all by the APF. So the correct answer for this one is gonna be 7.52 times 10 to the minus three. And again, we're gonna take our day exposure times our day life loss plus our night exposure times our night life loss and then that entire product multiplied by our APF. So then the next one for question four, we're given the following data and we are asked to calculate the APF. We have our stage partitions, we have our uh, loading probabilities for each stage partition, and then we have the system response for the partition. So to do this, we are going to multiply at each part stage partition, the loading probability by the system response. So once we have all four of those products, we'll sum all those up to get our APF. So when we do that, the correct answer is gonna be 2.78 times 10 to the minus two. So again, what that looks like, I've got my loading from the first partition times the system response to the first partition, same deal for the second, third, and fourth. Loading times system response for all the partitions, and then we sum them up. 
Okay. And then on our last question, question number five, definition, um, residual risk is best defined as, and that's gonna be the risk of inundation at any time. So remember residual risk is gonna be the combination of your incremental risk and your non-breach risk. So your incremental risk is gonna be the risk due to the presence of the dam or levee. Your non-breach risk is gonna be the combination of your risk due to intended dam operation and the risk of overtopping without breach. So all of those things combine to give us the risk of any inundation at any time, and that is gonna be our residual risk. So that, that is the questions and solutions to uh, the module two quiz. Any questions on any of those uh, quiz questions? If not, we'll get into uh, the homework three file and go through that solution. Um, just as a reminder, you know, when we get to the end of this course, we'll have a final exam and a lot of these questions that you're seeing um, are gonna be on the final exam. Others are gonna be very similar um, to some of the questions that we have here. So be sure to, uh, if you missed any, go through and review and make sure you understand uh, why you missed what you missed and learn from it. And then you should be ready for the final exam at the end. Right. All right, so let's get into homework. Three. And if it seemed like um, some of you were able to get at risk and others were not able to get at risk, and again, that's been typical ever since we've been doing this course. I don't know why it's so hard for um, particularly core users to get it on their computer, but it's just been an ongoing IT nightmare. So appreciate you all sticking it out, and I hope that the uh, no at-risk version that we provided was good enough to get you a feel for how to punch in some of these um, uh, at-risk formulas and to get a sense of kind of how things are going on, even if you don't have the, um, the project or the, the software. All right, so in this homework, we're asked to generate the FN scatter plot for the data that's given. Uh, we've got some nodal information here. Um, with the uncertainty for node three, and we're told to use a triangular distribution. Um, we're gonna have to calculate our system response probabilities, set a um, PERT distribution for our stage frequency, get our correlation matrices, um, get our distribution set for our consequences, again, add in the correlation matrix, and then Using that data, we're going to do all the things that we did in module two and actually calculate the risk. So this is a really good um, example that kind of walks through everything that we're going to do on a much larger scale with some of the software when we get into modules four and five. So if you can do this example, you can pretty much do really any um, basic calculations for a risk assessment. All right, so to start, Again, I've got, I need to get my system response here. And I've got um, node one that tells me that the river stage exceeds the top of levee elevation at elevation um, 1025. So anything above that, anything at 1025 or above is gonna be a one. And anything um, below that is gonna be a zero. Uh, I've got most likely values, so no uncertainty associated with node two or overtopping flow, removing the sod cover. And then for node three is where I start to have some uncertainty that was estimated. I've got three point estimates and I'm told to use a triangular distribution. So to start, I need to open up the program at risk if we've got it. We'll click on that and it'll initialize. And then once that's loaded, it's gonna add um, a spot to my tool ribbon up there. In just a moment. All right, that's now loaded. So the formula for uh, triangular distribution is gonna be risk triang. And then I want my lowest reasonable value 
my most likely value, and then my highest value. And I'll punch that in. So if I've done that right, I should get a, a number. Depending on how your settings are, you might get different things here. Um, I think the default is for that to be the mean value, which is going to be the average of our three inputs. Okay. So I'm going to do the same thing. That same formula applies for these other um, two stages, so I can just drag that over. Again, it's risk trying. We've got our lowest reasonable value, most likely value, and then the last input's our highest reasonable value. So then to maintain the shape of the system response curve when these distributions are sampled, um, I'm going to need to correlate those together. But before we do that, I've got a question in the chat that asked me to explain the def definitions of the lowest reasonable value, the most likely value, and the highest reasonable value. So the lowest and highest reasonable, reasonable values are going to set our range. It's not the absolute min and max that something can be, but when we're in an elicitation, it's going to be, you know, something that the team, when the team members are going through the data, they're going to put an estimate on what they think, you know, the lower bound reasonably could be. Again, we're not going to go, if we go the full extent of things, we could get anywhere from zero to one, and that would be too big for a triangular distribution. Um, your lower and higher values are going to be need to be wider if we're using a PERT distribution. But for a triangular distribution, we're just trying to get a sense for, again, how the probability changes and trying to set up, again, what a reasonable range would be. And then the most likely value is just like it says. So if I've got a range, the most likely value is going to be where that probability is most likely to fall. Is the most likely the mode? Um, it's going to be the one that's sampled most. So yes, I think it would be the mode. All right. So I've got my um, three distributions here, and I need to correlate them because I want them to. I want to be able to sample using consistent percentiles. If you remember back to module three. If I don't correlate them, it could pick high for one, low for another, high for the next, and we could get some wonky-looking system response curves that we don't want. So I need to make sure that when it samples, it's going to sample low for all of them and high for all of them and everything in between. So I'm going to highlight these three values and go up to correlation and then click define correlation matrix. It's going to ask me to you know, specify the inputs. I've already highlighted those cells, so I should see D21 to F21 in the box. I'll click OK. And then it's going to give me the correlation matrix. I can rename it if I want. I can add a description if I want. I usually just leave those blank. Um, when you name them, it is a little more helpful when you start looking at some of the outputs that um, at risk can provide for you. Um, I want each of these things to be perfectly correlated. So to do that, I'm going to have to change these zeros to ones. I can do it here, or I can do it within the um, spreadsheet itself once I've added the table. So for this first one, I'm going to go ahead and do it here. But in the next one, when I get down to the consequences or maybe the stage frequency to prove that it works, I'll just do it within Excel. So I'm changing these three values from 0 to 1, and you'll notice that the mirror image on the other side also changed to 1. It's the same correlation, just the other side, if that makes any sense. Okay. So once I've done that, I can click OK, and at risk is going to ask me where um, where to put it. They want the first cell of the Excel range where that correlation matrix is going to be written. So for our purposes, that's this yellow cell right here. Click OK, and that'll drop in my correlation matrices. 
Um, in practice, you won't always have these beautiful you know, rectangles perfectly <laughs> lined up to fit. So just really anywhere in the spreadsheet is fine. You can always move it later. Just make sure you have enough space for it because it will overwrite your data if you put it in the wrong spot. Okay. So I have that first correlation matrices in. Uh, my next step is going to be to calculate the system response curve. And the system response curve is going to be the product of each node for a given uh, peak stage. So for node 1, that means we're going to be 0 at 1025, but 1 everywhere else. I already have um, zeros in this first column for 1025, so I can just punch in zero um, for everything else. I'm going to take, you don't really need the one, but for completeness, I'm going to add it. I've got the one for node one, and I'm going to multiply that by the probability of node two, and then I'm going to multiply by the probability for node three, and I'm going to use the distribution that I've set up. So that way, every time at risk runs, it's going to sample a different system response probability. I'll hit enter there, and that gives me a system response for uh, 1025 and a half. And that formula is going to be the same. I can drag that over. So node one times node two times node three. All right, so that it gives me. A third of the risk equation, I still need my uh, my loading, which is going to be the stage frequency, and then the consequences. Any other questions up to that point? Pretty straightforward. All right, so next I need to set up some uh, PERT distributions for uh, the stage frequency relationships. When we do this, we first convert from AEP into our non-exceeding non Z variate. The reason we do that is because the spread of these values is going to be a lot smaller than the spread that we're going to get here. So that gives us a lot more options for fitting distributions. Um, we're also going to use those alt distributions, which allow us to set a um, specify a spe three specific percentiles, and it fits the distribution through those percentiles, and that way we can be more, we can be faithful to the um, stage frequency results that was given to us. Before we do that, I see a question in the chat. The question was asked in cell D37, why did I multiply by one? I multiplied by one because there is this first node here where we're looking at whether or not the reservoir stage exceeds the top of levy or not. So at 1025 or below, that's going to be zero. Above it, it's going to be one. Anytime you multiply by one, it's just the number, so it really doesn't matter. But again, for completeness and just to show that the system response is going to be the product of all the nodes, I went ahead and included it. So that's all that is. All right, so back to the stage frequency curve. So we want a PERT distribution. So that's going to be risk PERT alt. Okay. And then we're going to need to um, define the probability or the uh, first we need to put the percentile and then the probability and then work our way through there. I still need to just pause this. There you go. So I'm going to take my 5% and then the value for the 5th percentile, 50th percent that value, and the 95th percentile and that value. Okay. Now, keep in mind that the value that it returns, don't think it's the mean until it runs. I'm not exactly sure what it, what at risk will return, but I'm pretty sure that that number will change um, 
when you run things. But anyway, I've got that set up here. Um, that formula is going to be the same for, oops, I didn't lock my rows and columns. So I need to lock the percentile values because those are all going to stay the same. So I'll put those um, dollar signs in there. And then I can drag it down. There we go. Same relationship, just different set of data. So the next thing that we're going to do, um, I got a question in the chat. Um, just did the reverse order and got the same numbers? Is that always the case? Yeah, the, the, the order doesn't really matter. You are telling it um, the distribution. You're defining the percentiles. So it, it'll go off of that. You could have gone in either direction. Um, just out of habit, I always go from low to high. All right, so now we need to add a correlation matrices. So similar to what we did for the system response, I'm going to highlight those three values and then go up to correlation, define correlation matrix. My inputs are already set, so I click OK. And then this time I'm going to go ahead and punch it in. I click OK, find the cell, and add it in. And then I'm going to take those zeros and turn them into ones. So basically similar setup to what we did before. So I got a question. What is the definition of the non-exceedance Z variate? So we're converting these probabilities into um, Z space. So that's our standard normal variate. So again, we're going from the probability that if you remember, we talked about this. This is our transformation to put things into a probability scale. It's kind of analogous to what we do when we are plotting on a log scale. But instead of taking the log, we're going to take the standard normal variant. Okay? And then the non-exceedance is going to be the opposite of the exceedance. It's going to be 1 minus. The reason we do that is to make these numbers positive. So if I took... Um, just the standard normal variant of any of these probabilities. I'm going to get that same number, or I'm going to get the, um, a negative value for that same number. For some distributions, we, we can't have a negative number, so we always um, switch it over into non-exceedance. I'm pretty sure it would work either way. Um, this is just the methodology that our um, our H&H uh, &H subject matter experts ask, ask us to do. And again, that's to allow a better variety of what distributions are available. Does that make sense? Yeah. Very good. All right. So the spreadsheet then converts back out. So I I had the um, basically the the z z variate values here, and then I'm converting back here. So now I have a table where I have our standard stage and AEP. So that's what I'm going to then use when I'm calculating the loading for each stage partition. So when at risk samples the samples this distribution, these values will change, and I'm sampling basically different stage frequency curves within the limit for that set for my distribution. So now I've got two thirds of the risk equation. Uh, the last part I need to set up um, correlated distributions for my breach and non non breach life loss. Uh, question, what does the distribution value represent? Are we talking about these values or these values? Um, the alt per distribution values. Those, yeah. So it's a little, it's a little different when you're using the alt distributions. I'm pretty sure that that's 
the mean of the distribution, but the mean of this distribution is not going to be the mean of the exceedance probability because of how it converts. Um, so this value right here is going to be the mean of a distribution that has a fifth percent that hits this target, a 50th percentile that hits this target, and a 95th that hits this target. Um, in this case, these are going to be fairly um, fairly symmetrical because you'll see that that mean is close to the 50th percentile. Does that help? Yeah, that helps. So again, we're 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 creating a relationship um, based on the uh, stage frequency data that's given to us. That data is going to have a lower bound. It's going to have an upper bound and specific percentiles that define that stage frequency relationship. So we're trying to fit a distribution that's going to be faithful to those results. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be pretty good, and we're going to hit it at the 5th, the 50th, and the 95th for sure. And then you'll see when we get into Module 4, we'll have a spreadsheet specifically made to do this where we'll run the distribution and check to make sure that the means of, you know, the data that's given to us and the mean of the distribution that we're using um, are very close to one another. And we're just trying to recreate the results that are given to us. Um, the next question is, in a risk analysis, how would estimators know what values to enter for percentiles? Um, does not exceed Z variants aren't really intuitive. I agree they're not very intuitive, but that's all based off of the probabilities that are given to us that is intuitive. So typically, again, we're going to use the 5th, the 50th, and the 95th. That's going to give us our best shot at um, recreating the mean. So we've got a you know, shot at the tails, we've got a shot at the median, and then um, when things go through, we should get something pretty close to the mean. Does that answer your question, Joe? So like when we get into um, module four, we will input probabilities, but then the spreadsheet will do the conversion for us. We just have to decide what distribution we want to use, and it'll um, automatically sample the 5th, the 50th, the 95th as inputs. Okay, yeah, I wasn't sure if, if these are th these values get solicited. It looks like they don't, and then there's some math that's applied to them in the background. That's, Is that that's right? correct. That's correct. Yep. Got it. All Thank right. you. No, at, uh, one of the next thing in the chat says the AEP values and the no at risk spreadsheet don't seem to be the same. They are not going to be exactly the same. Um, here, let's pull that up. Well, let's see what we're comparing here. Again, these values, once things are run, your AEP values will change. And that will give you, after things are done, you'll end up pulling basically the mean value. But beforehand, um, these things are referencing something kind of random. So once again, once they run, and we were actually to pull a mean AEP, we're going to get what's in this um, no at-risk value. I'm pretty sure that's what I got in there. So let's let's hold that for now. Let me get through setting this up, and I'll run it, and then we'll go back and we'll pull our mean AEP. 
reason I put the I wanted the mean AEP in there so that when you all go through the calculations without at risk, you're going to get the um, a good estimate of the mean value on your FN chart. So these are means. This is not the mean of that distribution. That's just the conversion of this, and those numbers are not going to be the same thing. I want to say that they're fairly close to one another. Uh, yeah, 10 to the minus 4 versus something high, 10 to the minus 5. They're all always going to be a little bit higher, and I can show why that is here in, in a minute. But I'll have to run it first. So hold that thought. All right, so let's, let's set up our uh, consequence distributions. Again, we're using a PERT distribution. So this is going to be our risk PERT, lowest reasonable, most likely value, and highest reasonable. That's going to be the same for all of those. So I can drag that over. And then it'll be the same thing for um, the non-breach. So I can copy those over. I mean, there's other ways to define distributions too. We can go up to the tool ribbon and click define, and they'll give us a whole host of different ones by category, and you can pick. If we wanted our PERT distribution, we can select that, and then, you know, it has the dialog window where we can um, choose those. Um, I don't know how many people actually use that in practice. Some do. I tend to just punch them in. I, feel, I don't know. I feel like I have more control that way, I guess. But you can get the same result either way. Oop. So I've got my distribution set for um, my breach life loss and my non-breach life loss, and I'm told I want to correlate these together. So to do that, I'm going to need to highlight this first row and then hit Control to highlight this second row so I have them all together. So in the first set of correlation matrices, we had uh, three inputs, and we ended up with a three-by-three three matrix. So because I have six here, I'm going to have a, end up with a six-by-six six matrix this time. So I click Define Correlation Matrix. Click OK. And especially as these get bigger, I recommend making the changes in Excel, and I'll show you a handy way to do it. You know, when we get into um, RMC QRA calcs, they're already set up to be correlated, but it'll be a 50 by 50 matrix, and trying to do that by hand is a little time consuming. So I'm gonna click OK. I need the place to put my matrix in. I'll click that yellow cell. And then click OK. So because I want to correlate these, I need to make all these zeros one. The way I like to do it, I like to highlight the whole thing. And then I'll hit Control F to find, and I'll find and replace. So I'm going to find one, and I'm going to replace them with zero, and then click Replace All. And then I'll go through, at least it's supposed to, in my second. You need I'm to switch sure that. Not doing the other way, Damon. You're doing the opposite. You need to find time. the zeros and oh. switch them. Thank you. Yes. I'm going to find zeros and replace them with one. That's much better. Very good. Sorry, I was waiting for all those numbers to turn one, but everything else was going the opposite way. All right. So that's the quickest and easiest way, provided that you put in your zeros and ones correctly and don't swap them like I did. All right. So we've got our, all our ones in there. And now we're set to do our APF and our average annual life loss calculations. But before we do that, because we had a question about here, I need to, I want to mark these as outputs first. This is this was this part is not part of your homework assignment, but for me to calculate the mean AEPs, I need to mark these as outputs first. So I'm going to do that in these cells and make these 
then I'm going to call the mean value of that output. And these numbers will change after I run them. So after we run it, we'll go back and compare and see if we get the same values as we got in the no at-risk spreadsheet that we're given to you. All right. So we've got space to do our APF and our average annual life loss calculations. We're to assume an AEP of one for a peak stage at elevation um, 10.05. Basically, we're just force fitting a, um, our uh, non-exceedance probability into that first stage. Everything associated with that loading is going to be zero because this is our um, top of embankment elevation, um, but that's going to allow us to have our loading probability sum to one. So if we remember back from module two, we'll need to start with our midpoint stage. That's just going to be the average of the two stages that define the partitions. I'll grab that, copy that all the way down. The um, Midpoint stage for the last one, it's not really the midpoint, it's going to be the um, elevation at the, at the top, our highest value, the one that we're going to be exceeding. So then our loading probability for this first one is going to be 1 for, um, it's the AEP for our first stage minus the AEP of our second stage. I'm going to punch in a 1 for elevation. Um, 1005, and then I'm going to subtract from that the AEP for 1025, and we're going to have to interpolate to do that. We're going to use Lindsay int because we always plot on a probability scale. So I need the stage partition value at 1025, and then I'm going to go find my stage frequency relationship, so my X array are going to be these values. And I'll lock those rows and columns. And then my Y array is going to be the AEP values. And I'll lock that. And then I get the loading probability for that first bin. It's going to be pretty high. Again, we're dealing with an overtopping failure mode. If you look at our where our stage frequency relationship is starting, it's less than uh, 1 in 10,000. So 1 minus a really small number is pretty close to 1. That, that number is something less than 1, but we're just rounding there. So then for the next one, we are going to interpolate to get this probability, the AEP for this elevation, and then subtract the AEP for this elevation. I'm going to go ahead and grab this because it's going to be the same or at least close to it. So that gives me the elevation. I can just drag that elevation over. I'm referencing the same data, so we're good there. And then I'm going to subtract from it that same formula. But I need the second stage right there. So again, just interpolating to get the AEP of both and um, subtracting the AEP of stage one or the AEP of stage two from the AEP of stage one. Okay. Should be able to drag that down for everything but the last one. This last one, I only need the AEP of this um, first, el this elevation here, 1027 and a half. So I can cut out this other part by adding just a equal sign here. Okay, if I've done everything right, I should be able to sum that up and get a value of exactly one, and I do. So we're in good shape. Okay. All right. Next, I need to find interpolate to get my um, breach and non-breach life loss, and I'm going to need those for the midpoint stage of each partition. We're going to use linear interpolation, so that's going to be lin int. I'm going to pick my midpoint stage, and i got to go find my breach life loss relationship. That's going to be this one right here. 
my X array are going to be these values, and the Y array are going to be these values. Okay. I can drag those down, fill out that part of the table, and then I'll re repeat that process for the non-breach life loss. Essentially the same formula, just different inputs. You lock those. And then we remember that the incremental life loss is going to be the breach life loss minus the non-breach life loss. We'll punch that in here. Breach minus non-breach. Drag those all the way down. And now we need to interpolate to get our system response probabilities. And we're told to use linear interpolation to calculate the SRP. So. Again, that'll be lin int. I need my midpoint stage. I'm going to scroll all the way up to the top of my worksheet and find my system response probabilities. The X arrays are going to be those peak stages. And then the Y array will be the probabilities. We get zero for that first partition since that midpoint is below our crest. But all these other ones should be greater than one by some amount. Okay. So then for our uh, yes for the for the loading probability uh, for, for the lin uh, it was the difference between the stage partitions and for the incremental left office. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can you repeat your question? I, I'm hearing. I'm hearing you, but you're kind of muffled. And I really didn't hear you clearly. Uh, uh, the loading probability. The, mm -hmm. the difference of the state partition. And for the uh, incremental life loss, we just considered the so if I, still having trouble hearing you, but I think I heard your question. So the loading probability are going to be based off the elevations that define the um, the partition, those two values, and then the breach and non-breach life loss are going to be for a stage that's representative of that entire partition, which in our case is going to be the midpoint stage. Is that what you're asking? And then we'll same deal for the system response. It's going to be that one system response value is going to be representative of that entire range. So we pick something that's in the middle. Thank you. Is, is that what you were asking? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Damon, sorry, I'm getting the yes. different numbers for loading probability. Could you show the equation again? Yeah, uh, maybe next cell. Okay, thank you. Yep. So another question in the chat is, why was linear interpolation specified when module 2 indicated system response probabilities would typically be log linear? When we're dealing with overtopping failure modes, we will typically use linear interpolation, and the reason is we've got a zero that we have to deal with. So if I tried to use semi-log interpolation, I'm surprised that that worked. I'm very surprised that that worked. I wouldn't have thought that that one would have given me a zero there. Yeah, okay. You start getting errors because it starts, it's looking for things that it, it can't find. It, it can't take the log of a zero value. So we'll typically use um, linear for um, overtopping failure modes. 
Um, if you want to use semi-log for some reason, if that fits your data better, you can always make that zero and convert it to a really low number. We kind of default to 10 to the minus 20 when we're trying to make something essentially zero. So there really is no right or wrong way um, for which method to use to interpolate. Um, I guess what I'm giving you is just what we traditionally use for overtopping. If we were really trying to do it the right way, we would plot things out. We would look and see um, uh, which best fit a straight line, whether it be with the log transformation or linear or even uh, standard normal variate and um, select that. Does that make sense, Chris? So then the next piece, we have everything we need now to uh, calculate our annual probability of failure. That is going to be our loading probability multiplied by our system response. We do that for each partition. To get those values, our total is going to be the sum of those values. I'm going to have to go back and add uh, an output there, but I'll do that in just a second. And then next, I need the average annual life loss. That's going to be the APS times my incremental life loss. In this particular example, I took it, I guess, a little bit easier on you computationally because we didn't have uh, exposures for day and night. There are scenarios where Either there's plenty of warning or I guess there can be other reasons, but where day and life loss are going to be, day and night life loss are assumed to essentially be the same. And if they are, then you don't need to mess with the exposures. But again, that'll come from your consequence specialist. So I took the APF times the incremental life loss. And I can drag that all down. And then the average annual life loss is going to be the sum of all of those for each partition. And then N bar is going to be the average annual life loss divided by the APF. Okay. So now that I've got that all done, I need to compute the uh, mean values and I need to set things up to where I can sample um, the iteration data after I run an at-risk simulation. So I need to mark these three cells as outputs. There's a couple different ways to do it. I normally just punch in risk output, open parentheses, close parentheses, and then a plus sign. That's one way to do it. Uh, another way to do it would be to be on the cell that you want, and then you can click output here and it'll assign some name based on you know the cells that are around it click OK and basically you'll see how it basically did the same thing it just added that risk output uh, formula in front um, and we'll do the same thing for this guy so what all that's doing is it's flagging it so that when at risk at risk runs its simulation, it knows that it that we want it to store the output with every iteration that it runs. If I don't do that, all those numbers will change, and I can get a mean value, but I'm not going to be able to pull the iteration data. So if I want the iteration data, I have to flag things as output. In the in the next column, we're asked for the mean value. So that formula is going to be risk mean. And the single input is going to be um, that cell right there, C122 for APF. And we'll do the same thing here. Now, one place to be careful is this, this spot right here. Okay, I can pull the mean n bar value, but that's not going to be what I want to plot on the FN chart. 
have the APS, I have the average annual life loss. So for my mean estimate, I'm just going to want to calculate it here by taking the average annual life loss and dividing by the APF. Okay. Um, in this instance, they're going to be pretty close to each other. Our life loss doesn't vary by very much. But um, if you try to um, take the mean N from, you know, the the way the distributions were set up, if you try to take the mean end of all the different runs, you're not going to get the end bar value that goes with these mean estimates. So be careful there. Okay. All right. So now we're at a spot where we can um, run the at-risk simulation, and then after the run, we'll go through and we'll pick, um, we'll call the data for the different iterations. So I think it's good practice to always check your settings for um, your simulation before you run it, just to make sure things are set up the way you want. For Core of Engineers users, we want to make sure that uh, multiple CPU simulations are disabled. And we want, and for everybody, we want to make sure that the smart sensitivity analysis is disabled. Reason we want multiple CPUs um, disabled is because when at-risk tries to use multiple CPUs, it's going to open up a new instance of Excel to do, you know, the different different um, sets of iterations. Because we have macros in our worksheet, those spreadsheets are going to have to have macros enabled. And because of the default security settings, we can't automatically enable macros. So it'll do thousands of iterations on these spreadsheets, but without the macros working, you'll just get a bunch of errors. So unless you've got an air gap machine or um, your uh, company's policy allows you to automatically enable macros, you're going to want that to be disabled. All right, so I click OK there. Pretty sure that the instructions told us to do 10,000. Uh, I guess it didn't tell us, but I think that table set up for 10,000, which it is. So we'll leave it at 10,000, and we'll go ahead and click simulate. See what we get. So this is a pretty simple spreadsheet. It's going to take about a minute to run, nothing crazy. Oh, uh, when you start getting into, you know, what we would normally do for a risk analysis, we're going to have more than one failure mode. We're going to split it up into a lot more partitions than the seven or eight that we used in this one. So there's going to be a lot more computation time, a lot more calculations that are going on. Um, for a full project risk, you're, you're typically looking somewhere on the order of an hour or more. It'll make you really appreciate um, the speed of RNC total risk when we get into um, module five. Any questions while that's running? I had a question, David. Back on sure. the the life loss, can you can you explain why we positively correlate non-breach and breach? life loss, it seems like in my head, we might be eliminating the, the extremes or the tail ends if, if we're not sampling, say, high breach and low non-breach when we estimate yeah. incremental. So that's a really good question. And we, we did cover that a little bit in um, the module three presentation. So a lot of it comes has to do with what the um, what the life loss is most sensitive and dependent on. So, for example, if you know your most sensitive parameter is going to be um, like a mobilization, for example, it stands to reason that the a given population is going to um, respond well to if they respond well to a non-breach warning 
they're also going to respond well to a, a, a breach warning. Does that make sense? So if mobilization is really driving things, we're going to su typically assume perfect correlation because either I'm going to have a um, high mobilization for both sets or a low mobilization for both sets. It's probably unlikely for those to, to flip-flop. Now, if warning issuance is the key driving factor, you know, whether somebody actually gets the warning or not, that's going to be one of the instances where we're going to want to assume no correlation. So there really is no um, hard and fast rule of what to do. We typically assume perfect correlation because that's going to give us um, most of our stuff is um, dependent on mobilization. But um, I guess the guidance would be to go through and look at your data. You can um, use the tornado plots to see what's really driving the estimate. Then um, make a decision. And we either use we typically either assume you know perfect correlation or perfect. Um, no correlation, uncorrelation, because um, it's easier. But I mean, you could just to simply try to assign actual correlation values in that matrices if you wanted. And again, that's just dependent on your scenario, the data, and what's driving that data. Does that help? Okay, that's yeah, that's really helpful. Thanks. Very good. I, right. I have another question um, also on on life loss. Um, sure. <laughs> Go back up to the um, the APF AAL calculations, mm -hmm. and under under the intervals a thousand five to a thousand twenty five, why is the breach loss not zero? Not zero. Yes. Oh, uh, breach, breach loss. Let's look at our, let's look at our input. Okay, so the reason it's not zero here, and it, it's it's not going to cause any issue for us, but the reason it's not zero is when we interpolate off of here, the first stage that we're using is 1025.1, okay? So I don't have anything defined for 1025 and below. If I did, those should be zero. Now, when your input that you're trying to interpolate from falls outside the range. So like in this one, I'm trying to interpolate a value of 1015, but I'm trying to do so in between 1025 to 1028. You'll see that that value doesn't fit. It's gonna return the lowest value unless I force it to um, extrapolate from the data. So it's gonna pull the value for um, basically 1025.1, which is going to be that two value, 2.3. It doesn't matter in this case because everything is going to get zeroed out by that system response here. Does that make sense? So if we were really doing this the right way, I mean, really the right way, we would have everything... Um, fully defined for um, our consequences. So it would start probably at 1025. And if we had that relationship set, then this would be zero. But again, for all those partitions or and stages that are below the crest, the system response probability is gonna be zero anyway. So both my APF and my average annual life loss are gonna be zero. Does that okay. make sense? Uh, yeah, okay. Thanks. So, so it's it, similar to, um, let's say I hadn't gone up to 1028 here. If I'd have stopped at 1025 in that relationship, if I had tried to um, interpolate to get the life loss for these, these are outside those bounds and it's going to return the highest value. So that speaks to the importance of making sure that your all your inputs for stage frequency for system response for consequences are for the full range of, range of loading. So you make sure that, you know, you've got all those defined in your calcs. Cool? Yes, thank you. Good question. So we'll, one thing that 
we you might have noticed when I simulated originally it, it had started down here where the output values were and then it shifted up for the mean and the reason being is because of that stage frequency distribution stuff that we were doing up here so let's go look and see what those mean values were that's these cells right here and I think that those are going to match what we had in the no risk version okay so that's why those values were different so in the at risk version we've just got the outputs there the mean of that is going to be different after we run it and that's what we had put in that spreadsheet so that you all would get the essentially the same numbers in your final calcs when you were done all right so now that we've done all of that the the last piece is going to be to call our uh, the data for each iteration. So the formula for that is going to be risk data. And then we, our first input is going to be the output cell that we want to reference. So for this one, it's going to be APF, which is going to be in cell C122. We want to lock that, both rows and columns. And then I need to call the uh, first iteration, it be this cell right here. And then the last is going to be the uh, simulation number. Sometimes you, there would be, you can do multiple simulations. In this case, we only ran one. In most instances, we're only going to run one. So that value will be a one. And that's going to call the iteration, the first iteration result. Now, the result that I get is going to be different than the result that you get. And if I ran it again, that number is going to change because we're randomly sampling these distributions. So um, all these numbers should look different than what you had, and that's, that's okay. But the formula should be this right here. So then for the average annual life loss, the formula is very much the same, except now I need the average annual life loss input I need the same iteration and then the uh, simulation number, which is one. Now, for n bar, we have a choice. We can either call the data and pull it here, or I can um, divide those two, divide the average annual life loss to get by the APF to calculate the number. You're going to get the same result either way. Let's go ahead and call the data, just to practice doing that. See that one more time. Or I can also, I'll do that out to the side to prove that it is in fact the same, which it is, okay? So then if I have that all set up right, this is all set up to plot for you already, so I can take that and drag it down. The only thing that's changing is now I'm in that second input here, I'm going to be referencing all these different iterations. So I can copy those, take those all the way down, and then I should get my scatter plot over looking here. So your cloud of uncertainty should range from a little bit greater than 10 to the minus 3 to a little bit higher than 1 times 10 to the minus 6. And in this instance, our mean estimate is going to fall pretty much right on that average annual life loss guideline. Um, one thing that we, we like to do, like to plot things semi-transparently to try to get a sense of where the, um, I guess, the majority of the plots point visually. Um, you can very faintly see it. it looks like the maximum that we got for an APS was 2.24 times 10 to the minus 3. Cool. I haven't been watching the chat. Any, any questions on any of that? Thanks, Damon. This is Damon. I tried to complete the worksheet for last week. I am getting under so I am not sure. I I don't know what's going on with the server, but I could not be able to deliver. But I, today morning I talked to Wendy and I sent to that Excel file, but I don't know if it's received or not. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, I think I was, I think I, yeah, you sent me that email and I responded. Maybe we can, um, when this is, um, when we wrap this up, if you want to stick on the line and share your screen and we can look and see what's going on, maybe we can troubleshoot. But if I remember right, you had everything set up 100% correct. I opened yep. it and was able to run it and call the data. So only thing I could think of is maybe you didn't run it, but I would think that if you've got it set up right, you're smart enough to click the button. So we'll have to we'll have to take a look. Okay. But yeah, just just hang on the line, and then um, once we wrap here, I'll let you share your screen, and we'll look, and hopefully, I've got an answer. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the question was, for those of us using the non-at-risk version, is there a way to see our formula results? Example, risk output cells and mean cells. Uh, no, unfortunately not. So again, we're talking about in this area right here, Stephanie? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Just, I want to double check. My plot's all turning out the same, but I just noticed some slight right. differences in my results. Yeah, so I'm trying to think what the slight differences would be. Um, I think how different were they? Um, let's see. If we were to look at the loading probabilities and the APF, uh, it's pretty close, but there's some situations where you have, for example, that 7.55 e to the minus 8. I have 1.1 or 1.01 e to the minus 7 under, let's see. Yeah, that. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So. So, not, yeah. So the, the, re the reason they're different, again, is that. In the at-risk version, it is pulling this stage frequency relationship. Those are not mean values. So that's something that you could get in basically one iteration, if you will. It's, it's an output value. We have to run it to get this mean. In this spreadsheet, because you can't actually run it because there's no at risk tied to it, I gave you the mean value. Right. Okay. So if so so if I change that to what is in here, you should get the same thing. If I put those values in, if everything was set up correctly, these tables should match now. Not quite. At least I thought they would have. That's the, oh, yeah, they do. Okay. They just needed time to think through it. Does that make sense? Yeah, they do. It does. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, that was the only difference. And again, I, I over, I, I changed those values in the not at risk so that you would get the same result as everybody else that had at risk. deal. Any other questions related to the homework? So like in this particular example, obviously, you know, we, we have an average annual life loss guideline that we consider. This one plots right on it. So this one's borderline, maybe slight, looks like it's ever so slightly below. Um, we've got a decent amount of um, Uncertainty scatter, I think during the uh, office hours for this question, or somebody asked if the scatter was this big just because it was an example. And, you know, sometimes it's smaller than this. Sometimes it's a lot larger. It really just depends on your um, your inputs and what's really driving your risk. Um, you typically will get a large cloud of um, for your uncertainty scatter when you're dealing with extreme stages 
up near top of dam. Those are going to have, you know, a wide range within the wide range of uncertainty that defines them. And, you know, an overtopping failure mode like this one is going to be directly dependent on that. That's going to be the primary thing that um, really drives the calculations. So I was also asked during that session, you know, how is this helpful? Um, in this particular plot, the uncertainty scatter doesn't really tell us a whole lot. I mean, half is above, half is below. You kind of have to dig in to see what's driving it. And if there's um, something that's, that if we did more analysis or did more data that we could um, potentially refine that estimate, which could change the mean. Um, to me, the uncertainty data is most helpful for cases that aren't exactly borderline. So if I've got a mean estimate, you know, that's over in here somewhere, and let's say my vast majority of my uncertainty scatter plots above the average annual life loss guideline, I can be pretty confident that, you know, my even if I have uncertainty that we're going to exceed that guideline, even if I did additional work. Um, to try to, or investigation to try to reduce that uncertainty. Same deal if I plot below and the entire amount or the vast majority of my iteration results plot, plot below the average annual life loss guideline. I might still have a lot of uncertainty and a wide spread, but if it all plots on one side, I can be confident in the decision that I'm making and whether or not I exceed that guideline or not. Any other questions? Go uh, over again uh, the um, the values up around uh, where you have the output for the APF, AAL, and N values, and go through the, the process again for inputting in those cells. These right here where I am? Yes. Okay. So to get the total APF, that is simply going to be the sum of the APF for each set of the stage partitions. I'm summing all these numbers together. Okay. And then in the front part of the formula, I'm putting risk output open parentheses, close parentheses, and a plus sign. What that's doing is it's flagging it as an output so when at risk is running the iteration, it knows to store data from that cell every time it's run. That's all it's doing there, okay? Okay. And then I'm gonna do the same thing for the average annual life loss. Again, it's just the sum, and then with that marker there, and then, um, same thing for N bar, but N bar is going to be your average annual life loss divided by your APF. One thing that might help is we can look at the um, simulation results. So you, if I go to, I went to explore and then I click data, and you'll notice that the cells that I have marked as outputs are the ones that are going to show at the top here. At risk only stores the outputs. So I had I had um, marked these as outputs, and I had marked these as outputs. So like if I wanted to go through and try to find, you know, the results for a specific SRP, I don't think that I, I wouldn't be able to call that. If I try to do this data, let's say I want the system response for the first iteration. Yeah. It's just going to return that value because it never stored anything. Does that make sense? Well, even if I go second iteration, I'm, it, I got nothing because I didn't store it. If I had marked this as an output first and then rerun it, then I'll be able to call that. But before I do that, to prove it, let me delete this because that will kill my runtime. Just to 
prove a point. I'm going to make this 50 iterations to go real quick. So, so now, because I marked this as a um, an output, I can get up to 50 different results, and it's one for each of the iterations that was done. Does that make sense? Uh, and yeah. if I try to go above. If I try to go above 50, there was only 50, so I should get an error when I try to call iterations 51 and higher. Cool? Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Um, now is as good a time as any, because I haven't told anybody what the buzzword is yet. I think we're through this uh, homework example. So when you do your module three quiz the buzzword in the first question is going to be correlation 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 uh, there was a question Let's see where that in the chat so the next question will we or do we already have access to the solutions correct answers to all the quizzes so i've been going over the solutions um at the start of every uh, live Q&A. So to review those questions, you can go back to those videos um, and see those and take screenshots or write them down would be one way to do it. Now let's go to the website and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So if we go to the main course page here and go to watch the videos, And we go to the, it's always going to be from one behind. So the module two Q&A session will have the quiz results from module one. If I click here, make the ad go away. We start with the quiz questions and then the solutions. So all this is getting recorded. So that the best thing to do would be to go back there and, and do that. Um, yeah, that, that should cover it. Does that work? Any other questions? What's the room name for the quiz? Oh, good question. So it's going to be similar to what we did prior, but now the, the number is going to change. I did not put that in a presentation this go around. Um, so for this one, it's going to be DLS 105R3. DLS 105R3. Please repeat the best way to get a trial version of at risk. Oh, I guess the best way, I don't think they're called Palisades anymore, but we'll find Palisades at risk. Go to risk analysis. Apparently they've changed their name to Lumivero. You, when you go to their website, you go over here to start trial. And It'll ask you for your name, email, or all this stuff, um, why you want it. And sometimes it takes them a couple days to respond and, you know, do that. But once they get with you and, you know, you have all this stuff filled out, they'll communicate with you by email, and I'm pretty sure they give you a, a download link. And then you go from there, and it should be good for two weeks or so. It's 15 days, at least it used to be. Yeah, 15 days. So 
So then whether or not you'll be able to download it or not would be, I guess, based on your your company's um, IT policy and computer settings and if you have admin rights and what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. Yeah. Because you've been waiting for them to respond. I'm sorry they didn't respond to you. I don't, can't speak to that. Um, there, I know there are, there's other software out there, if you look, that does similar things. Like if you wanted to build your own probabilistic tools, um, like I found some free open source code for Excel that can be used. Um, if your spreadsheets aren't too complicated, you can use just the um, build your distributions in like we did for one of the exercises. So you have options even if you don't have risk of how to do some of these, these things probabilistically, but um, you probably are going to need a third-party software once you start doing um, more complicated risk calculations. Okay. Well, I think that cover, unless anybody has any final questions. I think that covers uh, module three. Uh, that module three uh, quiz should go live today. Um, and you'll have until the next live session here in several weeks. Um, okay. Um, so you'll have that available until the next live session to get that completed. Remember the buzzword is correlation. And that'll get you credit for having attended this one. Um, module four, the info and data should already be uh, posted to the website now. You should be able to find the transcripts, the exercises and homework files, and then the, the video should already be posted. That was posted yesterday. And then, um, so one thing with the Module 4 homework, we're going to need to use RMC QRA calcs to do that. So to get that, you're going to go to Software, it's going to be under RMC Toolboxes, and you'll see QRA calcs right there. And then you'll have this spot where you can download the spreadsheet. The, the spreadsheets are all going to be wrapped up in one zip file. And also within that zip file is going to be the, um, I call it the quick start guide. It's basically like a, use, a, a simplified user guide. And in the module four presentation, we step through the quick start guide and then go through um, an example. And in this case, the um, the example is going to be part of your homework four. So, in homework four, you're going to have you're going to be using RMC QRA calcs to set up risk calcs for a project that has three potential failure modes. In the module four video, as part of the exercise or example, I'll go through and show you how to set up the first failure mode. And then I'll also show you how to do, you know, the remaining steps for getting the project risk and plotting things. It'll be your job then to continue um, the example and complete failure modes two and three so that you can then finish things out. Um, recently changed in that um, suite of spreadsheets to get around the need for at risk and to give people some more, um, I guess, different comp computation options, we've now added the ability to do a deterministic analysis into all these spreadsheets, which is pretty nice. So for those of you who do not have at risk, you won't be able to run the simulation and get the uncertainty scatter. 
but you'll be able to use um, the spreadsheet to do everything else and you should get essentially the same mean value when you're done. So let me open up this real quick and I'll show you what I'm talking about. And that should be a wrap. So when you're doing things on like in the this calculation, as you're punching stuff in down here at the bottom, right before you get into the output and mean values, it as a default, I think it's set for deterministic. You can choose between the two. So if you don't have at risk, you'll be able to use the spreadsheet deterministically without any trouble. So if you, you know, try to use the free trial or it's expired or you just can't get it, the, the deterministic route's there for you. All right. Um, before we call it a day, there was a one last question that I joined a little late um, about covering, um, explaining why we did perfect correlation in the homework. Let's go to that real quick. So the reason we did per perfect correlation for the consequences, at least for the breach consequences, the stage frequency curve and the system response, is we want to maintain the shapes of those relationships. So if I were to plot these, you'll see how the system response is monotonically increasing. When I get a higher stage, the system response also increases, okay? If I don't correlate them, I could get something within the bounds of my distributions that looks like, say it picks high here, low here, and high here. I can't have that. Or I could get something that looks like this. That also can't happen. So by correlating them, what I'm doing is I'm replicating consistent percentile sampling so that every time I'm going to get something that has a oops, similar shape to these relationships. that falls in between these ranges. Does that make sense? So the probability for my highest stage is always going to be higher than the intermediate stage, which is always going to be higher than my lowest stage. So if you want to, again, reference more, this is what we're talking about here. So if you want to look at um, slide 68 and 69 and 70, that's where we cover all of that. We're just trying to maintain the shape appropriately. Um, the one difference again would be, oops. the one we're actually doing something a little different here is when we are correlating the breach and non-breach life loss together. Um, we also covered that, that's because at least we're not always going to do that. That's going to be a function of your data and what's driving the life loss. So if you've got something that like um, um, mobilization and how people respond to a warning, if that's driving things, then it's reasonable to assume that if somebody is going to respond to a breach warning, they're also going to respond to a non-breach warning and vice versa. So if it's going to be high for one, it's going to be high for the other. There should be some correlation between breach and non-breach. If it's a function of warning issuance and whether the warning actually reaches the public, then you won't see that relationship between the breach and non-breach life loss, and we would assume they're uncorrelated. That's also covered in these slides a few right after the slide that I already pointed you to. So that'll, slide 74 would be a good one to reference for that. 
Good deal. Well, if nobody has any last questions, then that'll be the, we'll call a close to this live session. Um, start working on getting through uh, module four and we'll get to start using some of the RMC developed tools to do these calculations, help you do the calculations. And then um, we'll see you in a few weeks. And as always, if um, you have trouble, feel free to email. I, I try to respond fairly promptly. And then, um, or you can always call or wait for the office hours, which will be in a couple of weeks. Well, thanks everybody, and we'll catch you next time. This is Steven. If you can, I can chat with you with, with yeah. a couple of minutes. Yes, sir. Let's do it. I will stop sharing, and then you're welcome to. Um, here, I'll make you presenter. I think I can do that. You have already received the email from Wendy. That is, a, I have the all simulation. Everything's fine. Only the issue is you are not receiving my emails. RMC is not receiving. I am always getting uh, undelivered oh. messages. So that is what I well, was. Good. But the previous email, you can see this is what. Uh, this is huh. I sent. This is always I got. I without attachment, with attachment, I individually sent uh, Emily and individually sent to you. Uh, and oh, no, this is one. This is when I received your response. Yes. After that, I huh. started to see this email. So uh, today, I, I was after talking to Wendy, I sent the uh, worksheet uh, exactly what I did in the homework. Everything is fine. I have the tool installed in the work computer, so I have no issue. Okay. Um, so uh, I think if you have already received that Excel file, that oh. file, I, I'm on one day late. I'm not sure what is going on. I talked with IT. I could not figure out why it is not delivered. And uh, hmm. okay, well, in, in the future, or, yes, sorry, not blocked or something. The IT system make you not deliver. I don't know what is going on because three of the emails, everything ending with uh, MIL is not. So uh, my homework and this is what this morning uh, I sent sent on last week. And uh, yeah, after put from the last uh, email, I was able to complete that one. I sent sending from. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, from the. Uh, so I don't know what is going on. So, if I is it okay if I have issue sending that email? Can I route to Wendy or someone? And that's correct. I wonder why they're not going through. Yeah, you can, hmm. I can forward this one after the return email again. Uh, so I thought it is something issue. Then I, I, the email address, everything looks correct to me, but I already, I only replying that one. So, but it is keep on coming back. So I so, send so this. Even with even when you send like an email directly to me instead of the training yes, thing, yes. if it's it still so gets kicked other, back because it's dot mil. Yeah. Okay. After last, after I received your email, I tried to send it back. It is kicking back to me. I don't know why. It's only I individually send one by one. Even here, this one, and this one, and then I send to here. Huh. Yeah. Well, that's weird. Yeah, I don't know why, so, but in the Wendy so I, today this morning after talking, as it went through very far, very good. So I don't know what is going on this one. So that's what I didn't. I could not able to make submit my last week. That's what I want to bring it. Other than that, I am I am good with that uh, module. Okay. Yeah, I understand. Um, in the future, if you want, maybe I'll I'll send you an email with my. I, can get, I don't care. I can give you my personal email address and then create a rule to forward it over. 
Um, and then you can also um, maybe send it through Wendy or Sarah at HDR to make sure that, you know, you're getting credit. I, I think I saw um, there was somebody else who had trouble. It might have, it might have been you. No, this is what I received from, from you. Wendy or somebody else. Okay. So you can get stuff from me. You just can't <laughs> send anything to me. Anything else, yeah. So, huh. but okay. yesterday what I did finally, I, went, I take this Excel file and send through my personal RMC. I don't RMC training. I don't know that it's received. APPAN69 at hotmail.com through that one. Yesterday I tried from my personal like, uh, email, but I don't know. I am waiting for, uh, I didn't receive, normally I receive okay. the Comberg received, but I, I didn't receive anything, that confirmation from my Hotmail gotcha. account. Yeah, anyhow, uh, yeah. So that was, that, was, that was the issue last week. But other than that, I have no other questions on the module side. Yeah, everything went very well. Okay, well, I'm sorry you're having trouble, and I guess in the future, if you want to send, Wendy, what do you think the best thing would be to send it through you and Sarah, and then you guys can forward it on to me? Um, Wendy had to go. This is Delaney from HDR. Um, I assist oh, yeah. Wendy and Sarah on the USAs project, but um, I think if if you want to send it um, to Wendy's email, if that if you've been able to get through to that email, I can let her know um, that that's the situation, and um, we can try to find a workaround there. Thank you. Cool. And then Devin, as a backup, I'll, I'll go ahead and send you my personal email address, and then you can try that too. That way, we're we're covered on both fronts. It should go through one of those two options, and we'll make sure you get your credit when you get your homework done okay. or have Thank questions. You. Okay. Very good. You, you got anything else? No, all good. Thank you very much. Good deal. Appreciate it.